oh, 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 well, 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 welcome to yet another episode of the In Search SEO Podcast, where we light up SEO insights like a bug zapper on a swamp. This week we talk to the king of local SEO, Sir Features, the one and only Sergey Alikov, where we discuss what role does proximity play when optimizing for local intent. Will Reserve with Google become a must for local businesses? And why might local be the optimal way to monetize voice search? I am your host, Morty Oberstein. I am joined by the incredibly inventive, the resourcefully resourceful Kim Ragones. Are you feeling better, by the way? Yes, I am. Thank you. Did you manage without me? Barely. We missed you. I try my best without you. I need someone to keep me on target. Yes. Also, by, oh, just so you know, I have a horrible, horrible cold. So if I sound like Bob Dylan, <laughs> you are. I, I, <laughs> at least I don't look like Bob Dylan. Anyway. Do not forget that we have a new episode of the In Search SEO podcast for you each and every Tuesday. You can find it on the Rank Ranger blog. You can find it on SoundCloud. You can find it on iTunes. You can find it on Stitcher. You can find it on Spotify. But do not forget to subscribe on iTunes. I know I mentioned iTunes. I'm saying it again because you can subscribe on iTunes and that way you're notified and you can never miss an episode of the In Search SEO podcast. Okay, before we get to my interview with Sergey Alakov, uh, and before you get to some of the latest ongoings in the world of local SEO, I want to talk to you about the Quality Rater Guidelines. Again? Gee, I'm shocked. Really? You don't You don't look shocked. You know, you look like you w- would expect me to say something like that. Oh, I get it. That's sarcasm. See what happens when you don't join the show for a week? I lose my mojo. I've actually wanted to discuss with you for a while now, for a few weeks, but my dear lovely audience, I could not fit it in time-wise. So because of all that pragmatic jazz... I do have time for it today, so we're going to talk about it. What are we talking about? At a recent SMX West conference a couple of weeks ago at this point, there was a speaker from Bing, I believe, who took a poll question, and then Barry Schwartz took the same poll question on SEO Roundtable, and the question that was asked was... What is more important for SEO, understanding the search quality raters guidelines or the ranking algorithm updates? Yeah, so I've been dying to weigh in on this for the last, I don't know, three weeks or so. So here we go. Unleash the beast. Here is the In Search SEO podcast, SEO Impact. Quality rater guidelines. Algo updates. Don't talk to me about algo updates. Algo updates. Are you kidding me? Algo updates. Okay, let me catch my breath, and let me break this down. It's important to breathe, Morty. Truer words were never spoken. Let's take the okay, let's take understanding algorithm updates on their own. Okay, not relative to algorithm updates versus the quality rater guidelines. So, do you know how hard it is to pull out real insights on an update? Okay, and and that's the big ones. I forget the smaller ones. I don't want to discuss the smaller ones. When there's an update, and I know I have to try to dig into it a bit. That's the expectation over here. I get depressed. I, I literally, like, I do not want to do this. I hate doing it. Okay, outside of some really general information, it's a lot of hit and miss. It's a lot of frustration trying to pull anything out of them. And what comes out of that is a sliver. So people do these posts all the time and then these articles that say whatever update, this is the authoritative take on whatever update Google just rolled out. This is the most comprehensive. This is the final word on whatever update just came out. Can I, can I tell you, by the way, okay, do you know, Kim, the biggest thing I focus on when writing one of these like, up, you know, one of these data pieces on a given Google update? I think it is you make sure your hair looks good and the profile picture. I don't, are you making fun of me because I'm losing my hair? That's not nice. <laughs> okay, all jokes aside. No, what I really do is try to impress and make sure that the reader understands that whatever data I'm putting out is A, broadly comprehensive, so it's not... You're not getting an entire, in detail, specific look. It's very generalized data. And even when I go into the data, I want the reader to understand that this is just a piece of the pie. It is not the entire, it's not the entire world of what happened during a Google update. I get very, very nervous writing these posts when I do them that people will walk away thinking, okay, so this is it. And people, by the way, do that anyway, even though I write, because no one actually reads what you write. They say, they look at the, the headers, they look at the images, and they look at a couple of people, you know, tidbits here and there but over and over and over again i'd write okay this is just what i saw this is just what i saw you can have seen a million other different things so algo algorithm insights are like a haven for false prophecy so that's one okay at the same time you get a general overview maybe a solid insight here and there but it's hard to get a real grasp on what's going on thematically so that's two that's my second reason against going with algorithm updates 
at all. Forget quality rate or guidelines. Getting into this whole rabbit hole of what goes on during a Google algorithm update. Okay, so why focus on the algorithm update when you have the quality rate or guidelines? Let's get to that. And I'm saying this, by the way, as someone who writes about algorithm updates. It's in my best interest to tell you, forget the quality rate or guidelines. Go with the algorithm updates. You can read my articles about the algorithm updates. But I'm telling you, as somebody who has a vested interest in telling you otherwise, don't look at the algorithm updates. You should look at the quality rate or guidelines. I am telling you the opposite of what I think is in my best interest. And why focus on the guidelines? Because you get direction. Now you can basically see, okay, when you look at what's changed in the guidelines, by looking what you can see what Google's focusing on, okay? What Google wants out of search. You know, I'm not, I'm, not getting, okay, I'm not getting into what, this whole question of whether or not Google can algorithmically do what it says it, it wants its quality readers to do, I'm not getting into that. Okay, leaving that aside, you all know what I think of that. You'll, I, I think that they can do some of those things algorithmically, uh, if not one-to-one, -one, obviously not one-to-one -one in, in general, the general thrust of that, but I don't want to get into that. Okay, leaving that aside altogether. Okay, even if Google can't execute the quality rater guidelines via the algorithm, the guidelines, as they keep getting updated, tell you what Google's trying to do via the algorithm. In other words, all things being equal, if Google could do these things algorithmically, I didn't think I, I think I botched that word algorithmically. It's, I blame it on the cold. Um, wouldn't it? Yes. Okay. And because of that, you get themes. Okay. You get SEO themes via the quality rater guidelines, safer content, more purposeful intent, more purpose for a piece of content. Okay. Don't, don't those things sound a lot like the things we all discuss and that we bring up as being the holy grail of all things ranking. Okay. Those are the things that were emphasized in the last quality rater guideline updates. Okay. By the way, ranking factors. Okay, I'm going to say something very controversial here. Throw out that list of the top factors. You know, you have this list and this factors. These are the top factors and those are the top factors. Throw them in the garbage. Forget them. Focus on the meta issues, the more holistic issues, entities, intent, user experience, brand authority, and then pull those fun factor pamphlets out of the garbage, shake them off, dust them off, and quickly read through them. I'm saying they're not important at all. I'm saying that they're way too focused on and they don't get into the more, we will call them pillars or, or foundations of what you should be focused on in terms of getting your pages and your sites to rank well. So there I said it. Yes, you said it. Maybe you shouldn't have, but you did. Well, we'll just move on then. Okay. Um, as you are aware, one of my faves sat down with me to talk local mm -hmm. SEO on the relevance of proximity, why focus on local intent when it may seem silly to do so, and money where Reserve with Google is going, um, how money may enter the voice search equation due to local. So here is my interview with local SEO great, Sergey Alakov. Cut one. Here we are again. Another SEO expert is about to join us on the In Search SEO podcast. This time, one of my favorite people in the SEO industry has come to talk to us about local SEO. He's literally on top of every change to the local panel, to the local pack, he is a local SEO machine. May I introduce to you the world-renowned king of local SEO, all the way from Toronto, Canada, Sergey Alikov. How are you? Thanks. Good morning. Thank you. That's, that's a lot to take. <laughs> it's okay. First, I, I just want to tell you, by the way, that I really appreciate you personally, only because there's been so many times where I've asked, like, hey, is this new? And, and, it, and it's not. And instead of Instead of calling me out on it, you're very, very nice about it. You're very gentle about letting me know this has been around since 2006. Where have you been? <laughs> Thanks. I appreciate it too, Marty. Sure. I have to ask. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, um, Sergey is behind a lot of the content that you see, the, the local updates you see on uh, Barry Schwartz's Search Engine Roundtable. That all starts from Sergey a lot of the time. How did that how did that relationship begin? How did you become this sort of search feature update factory of uh, of insights and the supplier of all things local SEO to Barry Schwartz? Sure. I, I think first time I noticed something new uh, in local search and just in search in general was, was a few years ago, about three years ago, four years ago. And I just tweeted at Barry and said, hey, Barry, is it new? And he said it's new, published an article on Search Engine Roundtable or Search Engine Land. I, I don't remember now. And it felt good. And I thought, well, if I could do it once, I could probably replicate it and do more of it and sort of try to start building some sort of personal brand on the web and on Twitter with his help and help 
of other great great local SEOs in the industry who ha have been helping to amplify some of these little discoveries I've made over the years. So I typically I try to spend some time pretty much every day or every other day just pulling my phone and, and searching for same queries over and over again, trying to see if there's something new there. Well, it's really, it's really been an amazing thing. It's amazing to see how many updates. I mean, there, there are like last week, for example, I mean, I think I saw you know, like three, four updates that you caught, something like that. Yeah, I, I actually haven't, haven't tweeted anything. I haven't published anything in a while and I, I have a backlog of things. Uh -huh. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of publishing or just tweeting at someone, but yes. Well, you should most definitely check out your blog. It's uh, alakov.com, if I'm not mistaken. And you will you will definitely find a link to his website in the blog post that hosts this podcast. And you will definitely see Sergey again in the near future on seroundtable.com. Okay, so with that, <laughs> let's talk optimizing for local intent. Um, you always hear the same sort of things, you know, NAP, reviews, identify your local competitors. I could go on and on and on. Can you offer our listeners something a little bit more substantial on what matters when trying to optimize for local intent? Sure. Uh, well, before we go into that, I, I would like to clarify what we mean by local search and optimizing for local search and local intent. That's a good place to I start. Usually, yeah, <laughs> I, I usually define local search as any online search that is aimed at finding a product, a service, or a business within a specific geographic area. I'm sure we can find a better definition online, but that's the definition I have been using for quite a while when explaining local search to my clients. You may have noticed that I did not mention local packs or local maps, Google Maps uh, in the definition, and that's for a reason. Okay. Let me explain why. One of my clients is an insurance broker, and they, they service the entire country. They, they service every province, pretty much every province with a few exceptions in Canada, but they do not have much of physical presence. They do not have uh, locations in every city and every province. What we found is that insurance industry is, is very, very lo locally driven. There is a very high local intent behind a lot of this car insurance and home insurance, local queries. So how would you go about building and increasing visibility uh, of, of a business that doesn't have local presence for, for location related queries? Okay. Well, you create content that, that answers a lot of location-specific questions on your websites or these location pages, hub pages. And we found that we were able to capture a lot of this visibility and a lot of this traffic and drive a lot of conversions without having actual, actual local presence. It just shows you that, I guess, I guess the, first, the first piece of advice I would give here is when you think about optimizing for local intent, don't forget the power organic search can bring bring to you. That's and, a good point. And the power it has. If we are talking specifically about optimizing Google My Business listings to rank higher in local Finder and Google Maps, we probably need to start by reminding our listeners and ourselves that that the Google local algorithm is trimodal. It's built around three pillars: relevance, prominence, and proximity. And you, and you hear about them all over the place. Everyone right. talks about them. Proximity is obviously not something you can easily optimize for, unless you think that opening a new location is easy. Um, I, I don't think so. So you probably uh, you probably need to look into improving your prominence and relevance. And there are a lot of things you can do to try to affect these things. Outside of what you have mentioned, there are things like link building, digital PR to, to grab more links and mentions, uh, on page optimizations, and so on and so forth. But but, but things you have mentioned, NAP consistency and optimized Google My Business categories and reviews are, are the basics and you do need to get your basics right before you move on. And I, I, find, I find with a lot of businesses that they think they are ready to sort of go to, go to the stage two of local SEO and they think they, they, they've got everything covered and they, they're doing great on the review front, they're doing great on the, on the NAP front, when in fact they aren't and, uh, and just doing a little tweaks and helping them out, improving this, this foundational ranking factors can go a very, very long way. Yeah, I mean, it's something that I think that people kind of forget about local SEO is it's so focused on the Google My Business listing, they totally forget the fact there is a totally other side to this of actually ranking organically for local queries. Yeah. Okay, so one of the things you talked about a second ago was um, proximity. and, and I. Let me, let me ask you a, a couple of series of questions trying to get geared at, at how relevant or how important proximity is and how it plays itself out when proximity is a problem. Mm -hmm. For example, let's say you have a business whose main profile, it may, it may not be local or local search, okay? If, you know, tax attorney in New York City, okay? That's, your, that's the keyword that you would show up for. 
Okay, you're going to get whatever tax attorney is, is nearest to you, right? I mean, proximity is such a big factor. But if I'm a tax attorney and I get most of my web traffic by being um, on all sort of you know, the best tax attorneys in New York City, all these lists, okay? Do I really care about the local intent of showing up in a local pack or if my site's locally optimized? Let's make it worse, okay? Let's, make, let's say that my office is located in a, in a location where no one is searching for my business, okay? No one has any tax problems within five miles of where I'm located. So if I'm a tax attorney, no one's showing, no one's, no one's Googling tax attorney in my geographic proximity. Why do I care about local packs? Why do I care about local search altogether? Or do I not? Uh, first of all, I, I, I don't know if there is such such an area <laughs> where no one has any problems with their taxes. Uh, especially <laughs> in New York. Uh, but let, no let comment. Me, let, me, let me move your search a little bit closer to me. Okay. I search for, for tax lawyer Toronto. And the local pack results seem to be pre, they seem to be pretty spread out. I see one lawyer located in Midtown Toronto, where I live, one lawyer in downtown Toronto, uh, and one in the East End. This just shows you that that Google thinks that for this particular query, tax lawyer Toronto, um, proximity may not play the biggest role. Things like prominence and relevance may may actually be more important. So that's that's where even if you are located in this magic neighborhood, and no one has any <laughs> problems with any taxes. You still have a chance of uh, of showing up for uh, for users who search for for your business or for your for your category for your industry outside of your locality. So you probably should care about local search. Another thing I noticed with my tax lawyer Toronto search is that Yelp page or sort of tax lawyer Yelp page seem, seems to rank pretty highly organically. And when I see websites like Yelp forums and other other business directories ranking ranking highly organically this usually indicates to me that there is an organic search opportunity mm -hmm. there because uh, they tend to rank for lower competition keywords do you yeah no, no i'm sorry I, I don't mean to cut you off keep going it's you're the guest you take it away <laughs> okay so also also i think whatever business business you run and whatever you think the main sources of traffic and business for your business are uh, people usually like to look up businesses online before making a purchase decision. They they want to see your reviews. They want to see your listing. They want to find your phone number. They want to find your location. So making sure that your that making sure that your local business, your Google My Business listing, is optimized. You have correct information there. It looks good. You have you have uh, you have good reviews. Is important, and and everyone should care about it as long as they have some local presence. Off the cuff, then. And I know Google My Business gets a ton of talk when we talk about optimization, but what about Yelp? Do you feel that Yelp gets the ignored too often or it's really, it's, it's the main thing is your Google My Business listing, getting up there in the local pack, getting up there so that people can see you as a top listing for whatever search they're looking for. And Yelp is nice if you have time for it. It really depends on your industry. And I, I find that, that for some, some kind of categories, um, other, other directories may play a bigger role than Yelp. Uh, for example, in, in, in Canada, there is dealer review website that, that ranks really, really highly for a lot of branded and generic uh, searches. And you want to make sure your listing ranks well there, as well as make sure you try to capture some of their reviews, some of the reviews on their website. In fact, when it comes to local search and reviews playing a big role in local search ranking algorithm, we find a lot of local SEOs find that Google reviews play a lesser role than some of some of the other directories and Google seems to trust Yelp, TripAdvisor and other websites a little bit more when giving way to their to, to relevancy of their reviews than their own. So you definitely should pay attention to other other directories and um, and try to try to get some reviews and try to get your listings in order there. I'm um, interesting. So I, I, I want to harp on something you mentioned before about Google. Google offers a general, even though you, your your business may not be in such close proximity to the to the searcher that Google offers a general area that could include a wide scope of uh, any geographical area of any city whatever it is. So one of the things I noticed is that as I'm originally a New Yorker, so I do a lot of New York queries just because well that's my hometown. So if you were to if you were to look at a query for a pizza in New York, you get a certain geographical area. And what I mean is when I'm not in New York. 
So yeah. one of the things you could probably bet on is if someone's offering you local intent optimization advice, they're going to talk about, well, you know, proximity is a nice thing, but you have people who are searching from across the world. Let's say I have someone in London trying to visit New York. They're going to search for the best place to eat New York pizza. So you want to make sure that your site's you know, optimized for local intent so you can get all these people from across the world who are looking to come to whatever location they're, they're searching for and find your website. Obviously, the pizza case is a bad example because you should always be optimizing for local if you're a pizza place, but uh, whatever. The, my my poor example aside, it seems that Google's ascribing a certain geographical area anyway. Uh, the best case I can give you is if you search for pizza in New York, even from 5,000 miles away, you're going to get lower to midtown Manhattan. You're not going to get Harlem. So if I'm a pizza store in Harlem, and I'm, I'm going to be the best pizza shop in Harlem, what, why do I care, right? If, if someone's searching them halfway yeah. across the world, they're not going to yeah. find me anyway. I, I see what you said. I actually searched for best pizza in New York and uh, and. An interesting thing I found was that a pizza place in Brooklyn seems to rank in the in the, in the local pack. I did see that. Go Brooklyn. Look at that. Uh, and the, the reason behind that is but obviously their name and, and the name of the place is Best Pizza and just shows you how important business names are. I don't know whether they they pick the name because of local search and trying to optimize for local intent, mm -hmm. but but it seems to work for them uh, pretty 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 nicely. Do you recommend well, doing that, by the way, to putting your name into the uh, into the business listing? Like, you know, the name of your location, you know, New York City Pizza? I mean, if, if it's not the name of your business, no, it's against Google right, Guide. No, like, right, 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 right. A lot of spammers do that. And if you want to see Joy uh, oh, yeah. after you do that, I, I wouldn't recommend. <laughs> I, I, know that, I know that some businesses have actually changed their names legally. Right. To, to try to get into local packs and sort of break into them and get get a little bit boost of relevancy. And usually smaller businesses can do that. And if that's something you're after and it, it seems natural and it looks natural, you probably could do that. But what, what it shows, what this best pizza uh, New York example shows is that proximity is not everything. If you have high level of relevancy and business name usually adds to your relevancy and high level of prominence, you may break into local packs where, where your location, where, where your proximity level isn't the greatest. Do you have now, any sense your, of how Google weighs all of this? How Google weighs proximity versus prominence? It, what I find is, is that it depends on the industry. And typically, if you search for a bar or for a pizza place and, 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 and you're at work or at your, at your home, and you, you will probably see places that are within walking distance for, for a lot of for a lot of sort of greater, more more complicated purchases for used car dealerships and for tax attorneys and so on and so forth, Google will show the results that are more spread out and where um, I think proxim uh, prominence and relevance play play a bigger role. Just because Google understands that the user may want to travel quite a bit to get to get the best possible the best possible result and the best possible listing. So it depends on the industry, it depends on on, on a particular business, and uh, there is no sort of even split between them. I know that some some local experts claim that proximity seems to be the number one ranking factor. And I know you did some some research on that, and you found that that in a lot of cases results are shown within very specific geographic area. But I, I do believe it it really depends on the industry. No, that's a good point. I never really thought about it that way. That Google understands the entity, right? It understands the intent behind the entity is being less localized. Like a a, a pizza place should be in walking distance, but a a doctor. Right most likely right. would not be in walking distance. You prefer the better doctor. That's a really good point. And that's that's a great tip for local SEOs or, or people trying to optimize for local businesses and understand the nature of the business. You should do a study on that. Let's do it together. <laughs> you first. <laughs> have any time. Okay. Let's talk reserved with Google for a minute because I, I think this is one of the most fascinating new developments uh, in local SEO. Are, well, first off, are there any drawbacks to it, do you think? I, I think there are. Um, first of all, in order to get into the program, businesses need to work with one of Google's scheduling partners, and usually there are costs associated with it. You need to pay your setup fees. There are sometimes there are monthly fees, or reservation fees. So a lot of businesses, understandably, do not want to pay for it mm -hmm. and are doing just fine with direct bookings. Having said that, I think eventually. As the program expands globally and into more categories, and into more industries, uh, and users get get used to booking via Google more and more, I, I, I think some businesses may find that they're basically forced into signing up for the program if they want to continue getting some of these bookings from Google search. 
I, I actually just found a new filter. I think it's new. I, I, might, I might be wrong. I highly doubt that you're, you're wrong. <laughs> in, in the restaurant's local pack and the, the filter is called find a table. And right. once you click on that, you can only see results that for listings that have this reserve with Google functionality. That's interesting. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty hidden right now. You have to sort of, you have these bubble filters at the top and you have to scroll right and you, to find it. But I, I think the, the more time goes on, the, the more program expands and the more people are used to it, we, we will see the, this filter and, and these sort of filters are playing a bigger and bigger role. And, and we may end up having users sort of look and search for, for business that they, that they can only book directly through Google. That's interesting. Do you think at some point, I mean, one that's, that, it's a little bit of a conflict of interest in a certain sense because Google's only showing you, showcasing you results that reflect that affect their their software partners. Do you think that's a problem if, if Google does offer a filter like that going forward? That's more prominent. It's a, it's a problem. It's a problem for businesses that do not want to work with their scheduling partners for the reasons I, I mentioned, uh, because you have to pay the, your fees, you have to pay your setup fee and your monthly fee and your reservation fee. So it's an, it's an additional cost, and especially for small businesses, for right. small local businesses, they it, it's not something some they may wa may want to be doing. Do you have any inkling, or do what do you think about the idea that Google will start to charge businesses in some way, directly for for being featured in the Reserve the Google program. I, I don't think it's very scalable for them, and Google always goes after scale. That's that's why I think part of the reason why they decided to go with scheduling partners, mm -hmm. and they have this sort of partners page and the Reserve with Google top folder on their website, is that it's it's a lot easier to scale. These partners will set up small businesses and and larger businesses in their geographic areas. They work with them, and Google will charge businesses indirectly through the partners. I don't know how the relationship works with them right now and whether there is an additional cost on top of the API calls. Right. You have to pay more it, it's Google been Maps. very murky. It hasn't been very clear at all how that works, actually. Yeah, I, I, I have no, I have no information on that. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure there is an NDA every partner has to sign and they, they wouldn't, wouldn't want to tell anyone how they work with Google and how to get into sort of what, what they pay, if they pay anything at all. But eventually, I think Google will increase their revenue stream from that either naturally just because of the pure volume of the reservations or they they can start charging the partners more they charge can start charging them a fee for example in the restaurant business i know that some of the scheduling partners they charge about one dollar per per, per per booking mm -hmm. uh, and google may ask for for a cut right, they, right. google may ask for 20 percent or 10 percent of that and it may seem small but at google scale it's going to be a lot of money Right. Also, I think another area where Google may find ways to monetize that, monetize reserves with Google and sort of these bookable services in general is through offering cost per, per acquisition bidding to more businesses. Right now, right now it's limited to hotels. You can, you can bid on CPA basis for your hotel bookings. I don't see why Google wouldn't be able to expand it into other bookable businesses. Right, I don't see why not at all. In fact, that seems to be the model, right? Uh, you have yeah. the same thing with flights a little bit also. The airline yeah. partners, right, the airline gets a fee based on, has to pay a fee rather, based upon the bookings that they make through, uh, a user makes through Google Flights. Let me, mm -hmm. let me ask you about revenue. I have another wild idea for you. So I think you were the one who pointed out to me that Google loses money on its voice devices. I mean, the actual mm -hmm. sale money, the, sell, you know, the money they make off of selling a Google Home, for example. And obviously yeah. the consensus is, right, that at some point ads are going to have to come to voice search somehow. There's going to be some, there needs to be some source of revenue coming in other than the, the cost to buy the device. But I don't see any way around it. Ads are impossibly clunky on voice search. I mean, can you imagine if I say, okay, Google, turn the lights off in my living room right now. And Google says, okay, Morty, but did you know you can save 5% on your electric bill by calling Bob's? I mean, when you call 1-800, oh my gosh, shoot me in the head right now. I don't want to hear another ad. You'll save 5%. So I don't see how ads ever come in in the way that we think of ads, at least, to voice search. Is it possible, though, that Google could use its model, let's say, from, from its hotel partnerships? To, to, uh, to somehow earn revenue through voice search, whether it be through a reserve with Google program, something similar to that, or something similar, to, or something where they directly get a referral fee. I mean, to put it down to a micro version, you order a pizza from Papa John's, it costs 20 bucks, Google gets $2. So Google has actually tried 
inserting ads via Google Home devices when users asked for for their day schedules or what their day days like. Um, they, they did it last year, two years ago, and there was a lot of backlash. I'm sure Google will try to find new ways and sort of try to keep keep inserting ads naturally, but but it didn't work the first time. And I, I agree with you. I don't I don't think I don't think it's very seamless, and I don't think users are going to be happy with that. Uh, as to your Papa John's example, yes, and that's that's sort of what we discussed, right? Google Google will want to try getting getting some kind of kickback, some kind of commission on all the reservations or any purchases users make online using using local search. And local search seems to be, at least to me, it seems to be like the most natural and the, the perhaps the easiest area where Google can start monetizing voice search. Do you think though, okay, so I definitely agree with you. I think it's a great point. And if you, if you ask me to where I'm going to put my money, no pun intended, I put it on that. Yeah, but some of the data that I've seen shows that people are very hesitant to to pull out the credit card when dealing with a non-human element, besides their obviously their computer, which is their control of. Well, one question is: Are users going to pull out the credit card? Are they going to feel comfortable dealing with a machine or an, an AI interactive uh, interface to to make a purchase? And two is: Okay, that might work for ordering a pizza because I I know what the pizza is already going to look like, whatever. But when I want to make a bigger purchase, does that work? And I, I only ask because one, okay, it's a bigger purchase, but two, right. I want to see what it looks like and then it doesn't work on a Google Home, it doesn't work on a Google Hub, but not on a lot of the voice devices. Well, not, when it comes to making a local reservation, right, a restaurant reservation or pretty much any kind of reservation, you don't actually need to pull your credit card. Uh, the reservation process is pretty simple with Google. Just select the time, select the number of people you're, you're going to have uh, in your company and, and you're good to go. There are services that you can pay for during the reservation, during the checkout process we reserve with Google. For example, I came across guitar lessons that you can book via, via reserve with Google. I saw that last um, week. Yeah, and uh, you can you can actually buy them. You can actually buy buy your ticket or whatever, Google call them for whatever reason buy tickets, but but you can uh, pay for your lesson right right away. The thing about credit cards here is that. Chances are, for many for many users, Google already has their credit card information. <laughs> if, you have, if you have an Android device and you have Google Pay uh, installed, Google has that information. If you have ever used your credit card with any Google services, Google already has that information, mm -hmm. and they and they can use it. And and you won't need to pull out your credit card. And it, it seems seamless. It seems natural, and you kind of trust Google already. So I don't see how how that is going to be an issue. And the more Google sort of sells phones and the more Google expands into other other avenues, the more credit card information they're going to have. When it comes to visual search, I don't think visual search is is very big when it comes to local search. Uh, you don't typically, you don't need to see a restaurant when you make a reservation because for me personally, what I find is that I usually make reservations uh, with places where I have already been to, mm -hmm. uh, I know what I'm going, what what to expect, and I don't need to see to see the restaurant. And I think that's that's another big part why why local search is is so important for Google in terms of uh, local in terms of voice search revenue because because users already know they want to make a reservation. Users already know what what they want to get. Users already know what kind of pizza they want to order. They don't need to see anything. They can just ask, uh, "Hey Google." Order order a pepperoni pizza, and uh, and Google can do that for them. That's a really good point. That makes a lot of but sense. It, but what but about when, say hotels, for example? Because I know Google's trying to get you to use hotel to make hotel bookings through voice search. I, I think it's similar in the sense because many well I, I don't know how many travelers, but some travelers and specifically business travelers probably already know where they want to go and they want to stay. If, if you go to, to one city all the time, you, you probably have your favorite hotel and you want to stay there and you can ask Google to make a reservation there. It's going to be more difficult to scale hotels because I agree, uh, users do want to see pictures, they do want to see reviews and read reviews, but more and more users start using the feature. I think Google will find that more and more users use it via voice search and, and the, the, there is revenue to be made there. That's a really interesting point. I mean, that makes getting that initial conversion, that initial sale much more important. Right, you, you get to my hotel. You've been to my hotel. You'll come again. It'll be seamless. You'll order another room. We book another room through voice search. So look out if that's what's going to happen. Make sure you get that initial that initial win. All right. So I have to do this to you. I have a segment. I call it optimize it or disavow it. It's basically while either I'll give you two 
really great options, and you'll have to choose one of those, and of course, put one great option aside and say, forget about it, or I'll give you two terrible options, and you are stuck picking one out of two terrible options. It's sort of a mean way for a host to deal with a very nice guest, so I apologize in advance, but it's what I do. Yeah. In this case, Sergey Alakov is going to play Optimize It or Disavow It. By talking about the local pack. Okay, so in the local pack, you either have your correct phone number listed or you can have a reserve with Google icon show up. You can choose to have one or the other one. You can't have both. That's how this game works, okay? Which do you ensure shows up? I know, it's like terrible. Which do you ensure shows up? That right, the correct phone number or the reserve with Google icon to make matters worse? The other two listings in the local pack have the reserve with Google icon. Now what do you do? It's actually very easy, and, and I, I know I'm going to cheat here because I, I have a Google My Business listing, and my, my Google My Business listing is not eligible for Reserve with Google because it's a service area business. Because I cannot have this Reserve with Google icon, I will go for the correct phone number. Right. Now, if I, if I had another type of business that is eligible, that's where it becomes trickier, and that's where it becomes more complicated. And I think you have to, as a business, you have to look into into your conversion rates, into your conversion numbers via different channels. A lot of businesses will find that most of their conversions happen over the phone, so they obviously want to see their numbers correct. Some businesses may find that scheduling partners or sort of forms on their websites and so on drive a lot more conversions than, than phone calls. They will probably want to get the, um, the, reserve with Google, uh, the reserve with Google icon. Now, it all may change as the program expands and we talked about it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that, that with time, this, this icon will become basically mandatory for a lot of businesses to stay competitive within the local space and sort of within the local packs, not just for CTR, but, but to drive conversions, to make, to, make, to make money. And in that case, businesses will probably have to choose the reserve with Google option. You know what's frustrating to me is I, I, I sit and I try to think of like, how am I going to get this guy? How am I going to throw him a curveball and make him answer a question that's going to be really hard? And then you come on the show and you answer in two seconds flat and like, yeah, yeah, it's easy, no big deal. Wow. That was very, 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 very seamless. Kind of not like an ad on voice search, but that was a total opposite of that. <laughs> Gosh, I got to work harder at these things, I think. Thank you very much for coming on, Sergey. That was really insightful. I, I really appreciate the insight, especially with the, with the uh, Reserve with Google program. I never really fully appreciated how much that could actually impact a business that doesn't want to get into the program having all these other businesses opt in. Thanks, Mori. It was fun. Yeah, definitely. We definitely do this again. And definitely check sure. out SergeyAlikov.com Alikov and definitely keep an eye out for all of the changes that Sergey will find in the local SERP features. Thanks again. Thank you. And we are back to your regularly scheduled In Search SEO podcast. He's a really great guy. There's really there's no pretense with him at all. Really nice to talk to him. And I think he's right about reserve with Google. The sites are going to feel the pressure to opt in as Google expands and expands and expands the program. I have yet to use it. So that's a good question. I wonder how many people do use it. So yeah, I'm kind of old fashioned. I like, I like calling to make an appointment. I know that sounds insane. Yeah, I'm the same way. I think it depends on the type of reservation also. For something new, like a new restaurant or a new hairstylist, I would prefer calling. But if it is a reservation I make regularly, I would prefer not to call but just have it done with a feature. But what happens if the time, service, or person I want is not available? I also think it's an excellent option if the place of business is not utilizing the native language of the caller. Well, that's a good point. Right, I never really thought about that, right? That's, it's, it's much easier to do it online if you have um, a language barrier. All right, by the way, let's keep it going with our poll question because after talking with Sergey, we like to know... Is local the most natural way to monetize voice search? Right, so is Google going to introduce the money element into voice search most likely through local? What do you say? What do you think? Let us know. The poll question will be... In the, pod in the podcast, in the blog post that harbors this podcast. It will be at the Rain Critter Twitter account. It will be on my Twitter account. It will be on LinkedIn. It shall be everywhere, I hope. So let us know what you think so we can shout you out on the next episode of the In Search SEO podcast. By the way, last week, we asked you to forget about a year, just over the last six months, to what extent has search changed? Meaning, 
has ter- has search changed in the last six months way more than it has even in the past year. And y'all, di- I, okay. So obviously the the implication of what I was asking is that yeah, it, it has. But y- y'all didn't agree with me. Uh, most of you said about sixty to seventy percent of you said. Where are the numbers? About sixty eight percent of you said no. The last six months have not been any different, any more volatile, any more changing than the last year or so. I still, I'm still going to go with what I, what I believe that the last six months has been uh, entirely different. The way Google is showing, um, relating to entities on the SERP, using its SERP features to target intent more heavily, and so forth and so forth and so forth. But you didn't agree with me, and I, okay, I get it. But I, I'm still holding to my, to my guns. Anyway, by the way. Speaking of, or speaking to, Sergey Alakov, he was at it again with a bunch of new updates to the local SERP features. Let's get into it as Kim takes it away with the news. Okay, Kim, take it away with the news. Google has added a way to mark your place in line by using the local panel. Showing for some restaurants, the feature allows you to see how many people are ahead of you, as well as the wait time. This way you can save your place in line, do something else, and head over to eat when your turn has arrived. So I'm just going to plug him again. Guess who found that? That was Sergey Alakov. He had last, over the last week or so, he's just had a, a slew of local surf feature updates. Check him out on Twitter and see them all. So another Googler is pushing media on the SERP. Gary from Google recently said, Google images and video search often is often overlooked, but they have massive potential. We don't know exactly what is coming, but it looks like big things are headed our way when considering image search and the like. Can't wait. Sitting on the edge of my seat. By the way, I talked about this. I did a video on LinkedIn last week, so check it out my LinkedIn profile. It's also on, I think I tweeted it out also on how Google is going to be using media like images and so forth to create a SERP that feels like a social media environment. So check out that video as well. A new format for the video carousel has been popping up all over the mobile SERP. Now mobile video carousels are not a carousel, but a grid box that contains four videos. So I've actually seen people say that they're, they've seen these new uh, video box formats on mobile with as much as as many as eight videos um, in the in the new box feature. So obviously the new format takes up a lot more space, whether it be four, whether it be eight videos in there. So I'm, I'm just saying. It seems Google is now automatically opting businesses into receiving calls from Google Home. Too much with the opt-ins. Trust your product. Give people autonomy. You don't have to go with auto opt by the way, uh, speaking of Google data, I just want to point out that um, you should know public service announcement. Google has announced that um, a lot of the app data in Search Console is going to be removed. Many of you probably gotten notices about this. So just be aware that app data, Google let you integrate your some of your, your, your app data into Search Console. That's going away. Uh, so you should use Firebase. Okay, thank you for the news. Now as our time wanes... Let us ask the ever-intriguing, the ever-relevant, fun SEO send-off question. Can I opt out? Why am I automatically opted into this thing? Oh, touche. Yeah, you can opt out. Go ahead. You want to take the easy way out of this? Go ahead. Go ahead. You can opt out, but I'm going to ask anyway. So this week, my brain has asked the following fun question. If Google were to be reincarnated, what would it come back to? How do you say that? What would it come back as? If Google were to be reincarnated, what would it come back as in the next life? Kim, going to tell me? Um, are you, are I you actually, still opting out? Yeah, I'm opting out <laughs> because I have um, no idea of a good answer, actually. Okay, so the truth is I stole Kim's answer because I... okay. My answer is, and it's too easy, it's low-hanging fruit, Google in the next life will come back as Bing. Because that would be some sort of bizarre form of karma, wouldn't it? Yes. So Kim emails, Kim emails me, you know, for the fun SEO send-off question, which I hate doing, I'm going to say Bing. And I'm like, too late. I already said Bing. <laughs> so she said, I'm not doing it anymore. That's it. I'm done. And then I cannot <laughs> answer anything. That's it. it, it we, we could apply a canonical tag to her answer and say that, see my answer, which was Bing. So Kim says Bing. Why not DuckDuckGo, by the way, or, or, 
or I don't know, Yahoo. I don't know. Just Bing, seem, Bing seems more appropriate if we're going to talk about karma. I don't know why. Whatever. It's coming back as Bing, and that will do it for us. Thank you so much for tuning into the In Search SEO podcast. Remember, next week, we have an all-new episode coming out on Tuesday, so tune into that, and it's In Search because we're all in search for something. Thank you. Bye.